Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Amir Abbas and today we have a very special guest with us and I'm really thankful to her, uh, Dr. Tazeen Saeed Ali, for giving her uh, time from her very busy schedule. Dr. Tazeen Saeed Ali is currently serving as an interim dean, the Shakur Jamal Indoor Professor at Aa Khan University, School of Nursing and Midwifery in Pakistan. Additionally, she serves as an Associate Dean of Research and Innovation in Aki Aa Khan University School of Nursing. She has a joint appointment as a faculty member at Community Health Sciences at Alhan University, and she, she used to be my faculty. She's my one of my mentors, uh, from whom I've learned a lot. She worked as a clinical nurse, but currently, the way she identified herself is a very senior researcher. She has more than 400 publications in different journals around the world. Some of her publications are in journal with extra, very high impact factor journals. Apart from that, she brings a lot of grants to Alhan University. Currently, she is working on around 23 grants and we are going to talk to her. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Tazin Saeed Ali, for giving us time. And I understand that you had some problem, all of us are, all of us are facing some problems in relationship to electricity. So thanks a lot. Uh, you had to make some shifting in the logistics at the last minute. Uh, so how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. And uh, I am always ready for any kind of unnecessary circumstances because by, by reaching, you know, by reaching this position, it's it seems like that one really has to learn a lot and then uh, really have to go through many, many challenges. And then you become so much resilient that whether there is electricity or no, whether the UPS system, the data system working or not. In any case, I am now I am ready to do, you know, take any kind of task. And then this is always a pleasure to meet with you and you. I have been one of the brightest uh, students from your cohort. And even afterwards, I noticed that you, the what uh, contribution, what you are making is really marvelous. And I'm really glad to see that you are coming up with this, this different interviews and everything and all making the entire world understand what is really happening, what kind of challenges people are facing in the developing country not only within the developing country, but as a women, you know, it's, it's not easy to live with the family, run the family and then run your different positions and conduct researches and try to help other populations, including men, women, elderly, children, everyone and all. So uh, the life is not that simple, but definitely uh, I can contribute and I'm really proud of what you are doing at the moment, honestly speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you. That means a lot for me. And so it's saying that an overnight success has decades of story behind it, right? And that seems to be the summary of your your life. Uh, like we currently see you at the, one of the top positions at Aachen University. But uh, I mean, people see what is in the front, but they do not know what person has to go through and how many, as you said, the challenges. So uh, would you want to uh, give us your background that how... Uh, a bit of your obviously you are you have a nursing background so i'm assuming uh, so for your early education your nursing background and then how you shifted into rather than going into clinical practice you came into research world uh, so how did that happen i really would like to go a little bit uh, before the nursing background also because i think that contributes a lot in developing your characteristics and traits in handling the situation my family, basically, uh, my parents migrated from India. And when they migrated, they left behind their all the properties and uh, everything, mm. even some of their degrees and everything they couldn't carry with them when they came here to Pakistan. Um, though my mother was too young, but my father was having some understanding. So they couldn't bring, he couldn't bring his uh, school documents and everything and all. When they moved here, they had a lot of hardships. And then they, they used to tell us each and every time, whenever we used to sit together, that what kind of hardships they were having. They left their properties and everything and all and moved here. They, they were pretty young and then had to really struggle and everything and all. And then we were, you know, we five sisters and brothers there. Uh, my my father always used to tell us that this is what we have got. This is what we have not got. So since then, we learned that whatever is the circumstances, we need to start adjusting in the situation. It's important. And it's always, you know, it's always necessary to be happy and, and thankful that whatever we have, and we should be really happy with that. And then, you know, slowly and steadily, um, we were struggling, all of us, and then slowly and steadily, all of us, my, my elder sister, 
picked up her homeopathic doctorship and then my brother picked up his that machinery you know engineering and slowly and sadly and then my time came i was not sure what i'm supposed to do and one one day uh, the entire college students were taken to the afan university where i learned that uh, to you know there are such a good libraries and everything and all and i can become a nurse and when i became a nurse and i was so proud because i was able to t- help not only my communities but also my families and the entire family said oh wow this is one of a very great profession and no one ever thought about it in our entire family what is happening and all so slowly and steadily um, that struggle began and then uh, because i was the only one in my family again a lot of questions used to come many many discussions used to rise looking at the nursing image and all and then even at aga khan university i am a part of minority like in my class uh, we were only two who were uh, who were basically non smileys and the another girl was not very much interested in her studies she used to say i find pass i'm okay i don't have to struggle a lot and i was the only one who really had to struggle a lot and then slowly and steadily when i graduated i was not you know been offered a very good job a normal job and i was little bit surprised that my entire class is having such a good job and why i'm not having it and then yeah. as we were i was moving along and then i said department of community health sciences came to know about me and they said we want this girl because she was so active when she was a student and then when i joined ch's department the culture of research i learned from there honestly speaking and then uh, slowly and steadily i started understanding that without research uh, nothing can be done and then i became the field director of one of my urangi uh, project you know that urangi is the largest squatter settlement in at karachi and then there are so many issues and most of the people over there have been migrated from di- different part of the world and then they were also struggling and i could really understand their situation because contextual understanding was making me talk to them making me to understand them making me to speak to them and they were really comfortable and open with me and slowly and steadily i started working with the community then i first time realized that until unless i have a good monitoring system it's not possible to be able to understand well men led kids are and then i developed you know digital world wasn't that common at that time then it was basically 1991 to 1994 time so i developed a big two boards and i said i i requested carpenter to make two big boards for me and then i requested uh, the paper maker that if i could have a big paper if you could make a big sheet for me and then i used the different pens and then i made a entire map by myself and then i started putting in different pens if it was a malnourished baby and everything that monitoring system became so popular that whoever was coming to the pilot project everyone used to come to rangi town and then they were looking at it and this is how we came to know how many malnourished children are how many non malnourished and we used to click the pictures at that time we did not have digital cameras or smartphones like this so different pictures and i used to you know give give it for the washing and i used to compare and then we started jotting down everything in in, in our desktop that how many children are improving and all what with what interventions and slowly and steadily we realized that you know having national health workers because at that time we never had national health workers if you recall uh, the national health workers program started in those days and i was the one who developed the curriculum with the government over there i became so popular and then afterwards i conducted the first training of national health workers for the urangi town and then uh, while i was conducting the training i also started realizing that so many gaps are there and i said why these gaps are there we need to work for these gaps and all and then everyone requested me if i, I could move to another area but i knew exactly the gaps of urangi town what issues they are having and what need to be done and i really wanted to do something about it so i started documenting and then i moved to sultanabad as soon as i moved to sultanabad i realized while i was conducting my clinics i was looking at antenatal care provision of care postnatal natal and i used to conduct deliveries also independently but when uh, these dyes and you know traditional birth attendants started coming to my field i started giving them training and then i also used to you know be there whenever training so at some time at home level we used to conduct deliveries then i realized a lot of women are getting a lot of services men being taken care 
at some level but somehow everyone is forgetting about adolescence and then especially girls and boys they were so confused so many issues but there girls were having a lot of menarche and menstruation problems they were using a lot of unhygienic materials and i started realizing okay there are gaps at urangi town i identified it, it was a children who were really being ignored and here at i identified it's the adolescents who have been ignored and no one is taking care of them then i said well the time has come i have to do something about it and then suddenly cnn and people came to sultanabad and they wanted to conduct an interview of someone who could really talk about epidemics you know there at that time we had an epidemics uh, multiple different kind of epidemics including cholera and also some kind of uh, flu and all so then they wanted to talk to me that how i'm handling it and everything and all while giving them a talk no i realized that it's important that uh, i need to learn about these epidemics and all and this is how i became a first nurse in pakistan who completed her masters in epidemiology and biostatistics it was a tough one because uh, because mm. no one was aware that nurses can do this there was no scholarship available by the mm. hec or anyone uh, which could be given to the nurses because somehow it the understanding was um, it's the mdbs doctors and those who are already in you know chemist or you know they were having all but there wasn't any scholarship available for the nurses so then i sold out some of my properties actually mm. and then i requested my university if they could support me something so my university said that you don't have to pay the tuition fees now you can pay later on however you have to you know take care of your research part and many things by themselves and many other things were there like students fees and many other things were there which i really had to pay and then i really paid from it. but you know that the system you are a ek you graduate that you do not get it from the day one in your first semester you have to pay by yourself and then slowly and steadily from so so first semester i had to pay by selling my properties and you know many things and all so you know all these struggles basically made me focused then i realized that i have spent my time i have been struggling i am spending all my properties which we received from the back family so many things were there and i said now the time have come that i have to be really serious and try to help others because i do not want anyone else suffering like me you know mm. i really want to help them out but if you have to help them out it's important that their physical health and all different forms of physical mental social everything has to be you know very normal they need to have a they need to maintain well being so i said that i need to do something about it so while i was doing my ap bio i conducted a research in the area of postpartum practices so you would say that why uh, suddenly from the adolescent health i have moved to postpartum practices because when i was working at sultanabad i realized that when girls are not maintaining her hygienic practices they are having infertility and as soon as they are having infertility they are having a lot of issues and then they are somehow and some of the women some of the girls who are men, who are having unhygienic menstrual practices if they become pregnant even in their postpartum period they are maintaining the same kind of you know unhygienic practices rather they were having more hazardous practices inserting of unnecessary things within the reproductive tract which is not required so many things then i said i want to pick up my three researches you know we get the opportunity to conduct many number of researches but you always pick up one so the first research i have i picked up was my nutrition because i thought that i need to help the people over there at urangi town to be able to do that and then it was a small research i worked on it and then i uh, disseminated sorry, my sorry sorry to didn't to intervene here but uh, i mean you said so many things i definitely i mean we'll talk about your research experience but at this time uh, what i would want you to do is because that's a bit important for me and also important for audience that you said so many thing before going into your research experience i want to go a bit more into that and take out the message from it so first of all uh, i want you to talk about okay and in, in our country nursing is a i mean globally nursing is one of the most recognized discipline that is one of the most noble discipline but somehow in our country that is uh, frowned upon in the in a way i mean our khan university is one place where i think uh, nurses get the respect they deserve for most of the times but at other places especially in the government sector so here's the thing like you uh, 
And I want you to speak to people about that. And I want you people to see that, okay, through the nursing route, you not only can get to the top, but even you can lead those. Uh, I mean, you are better than many doctors uh, or like most of the doctors, right? How many doctors come to the position of a dean of the or of a university, which is the leading university in Pakistan, right? So uh, first of all, I want you to speak a bit. For example, uh, I mean, I want nursing to be taken not as something which you don't get admission into anything and then you go into nursing rather than okay i don't want to become a doctor i want to become a nurse so what do you want to say to that okay thank you thank you for taking me back to 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 that because i initiated and definitely i moved towards my research one actually at the time when i became a nurse it i only became a nurse because it was aga khan university if i would have taken if my class would have taken to jinnah or any holy family or any any other places i think i wouldn't have picked up this profession because yeah. aga khan university uh, was giving me so much of uh, you know opportunities the entire students to to learn to grow to have their career pathway and their higher education you know those kind of and then i noticed over there that there is you know they give respect to everybody and then you know discrimination is not there and all and i joined it you know i joined it but it was very difficult for me that the society would accept me because i belong to different sector and then in our sector not many people become from sunni and shia sector not many people become you know nurses but yes from christianity and from smiley sector a lot of people do become nurses and all so it was very tough it was it was it was not easy for me especially when i used to wear my uniform as a student when i used to go uh, in my post r and bsc in program a lot of people used to stare you know here and there but the good point was that the entire people were confident that if they need to have any kind of guidance i am the right person and many people tried that and somehow i used to guide everybody what they need to do and all and you know that we are very pretty good in our skills because of our university help us to develop the skills and moreover nursing professions uh, gets a lot of clinical competencies and then because i was working later on at the community level so i got more opportunity to practice when there is no doctor right then i was been i took the entire certification of who training of where there is no doctor so i was having little bit more knowledge understanding at that time we never called nurses as a nurse advanced nurse practitioner yeah advanced practice nurse right but today i'm realizing whatever i was doing i was actually working as an advanced practice nurse um which today we are realizing that that was the time when my training and my certification my entire thing was being done and based on that i was providing the care to the entire community when there was no doctor right so we were having two doctors coming but it, they were only coming for two days a week or something like that but i was going daily basis so the entire 25000 population was very much dependent on me similarly the entire area where i used to live at tarik road people were really much dependent on me you know so then slowly and steadily though there were so many challenges the issue of image the issue people used to think that whoever comes to this profession they belongs to a very poor family very lower family those who do not have any respect in the entire community are the ones who become nurses and people used to mix nurses with many of the you know uh, caretakers and those kind of stuff and all so they were not sure and they never imagined a nurse could speak up could be you know intermediate and then could do her masters and phd and all they never see that especially in my community but slowly and steadily they have started now today from my community there are many many nurses many many doctors nurses you know many other profession they have picked up even pharmacists you know i think it seems like i am the one who you know entered into the medical side and then slowly and steadily many people so today honestly speaking because of aga khan university i must say that all others um, universities and institution have adopted it people do not give us full recognition uh, they quietly have adopted our curriculum they have quietly taken up our scores grades and everything and all mm. which we are absolutely fine with that and people are doing because whoever have adopted it they are also our outcomes right they have become the heads of the different school of nursing and they are providing that but still you know still i would say that as soon as people come to know that someone is the professor or a graduate of aga khan university mm. they get a different respect they get a different response but as soon yeah. as they come to know someone is belonging to any other institution 
or they are the professor in other institution people do not give them that respect and all so we are still having a lot of issues you know and then if we look at the scholarships if we look at many things and all people were having a lot of issues but today i'm really glad that slowly and steadily our government has started supporting nurses also we are having less scholarship we are having many other scholarships and then people like me who have grown up uh, have completed their doctorate and post doctorate and become professor whenever we bring our research grants and scholars we always build four to five phd students eight to 10 master students you know we try to build students in that when and then four to five postar and dscn students so we try to give them scholarship try to give them full scholarship try to bring from our grant so by conducting the researches and bringing in funding it's not only helping us to be able to understand what are the issues of the people and help them back but also we are helping our nursing students to get the scholarships and all so that they can study they can grow you know they can do many many things around and all and we are also support giving jobs to many of the people who are working with us who do not have any platform and they are working with with the nurses so slowly and steadily today the world has really gone change and i'm really glad that agar khan university honestly speaking have contributed a lot but i think graduates play a big role people like me who were not the part in the beginning you know i was the only one and my another colleague who never took anything very serious but i was the only one who really you know wanted to bring the entire chain the image and everything and all so when we were doing uh, doing that we also had many other challenges you know many right. many other challenges. So people were only thinking we are nurses and then we are nurses 24 hours we do not have any other feelings you know we can't have uh, our own life you know so there were many many challenges and issues because image image of the nurse was was a big thing right and then uh, you uh, so i want you to briefly speak about uh, so you said that you did your bachelor's in nursing from al khan university then you did master's msc epidemiology and biostatistics from al khan university and then you did your phd and postdoc as well so i want you to briefly talk about that experience and then we come to the our main topic related to the challenges and research in pakistan sure sure you know let me start little bit uh, from the earlier when yeah. i did my diploma when i did my diploma it was very difficult for me because all my class fellows they were so much different in their english language you know that they used to speak up their understanding of the entire world politics uh, democratics everything was so different because they are already having they already gone through a night school they already gone mm-hmm. through a school where they were learning everything and all i came from a school run by nuns you know and then nuns right. do not teach these kind of stuff you know that they are so simple so humble people so i learned humbleness i learned you know being nice with the people i learned different things and all i never learned about politics i never learned about uh, how to portray myself how to dress up you know i very simple way and everything and all because this is what i learned from the nuns and then i moved to a college even college was very simple though i was the captain i was the commander of the ncc program and i knew my leadership qualities i had many many things but it was very different style when i came to arf university first year i used to keep quiet all the time i used mm. to look at people who what people are doing some of my teachers you know dr nilofer dr uh, parvez who is not here in this world now may allah give her uh, higher level at janna so miss ann fernandez miss rubeka and then miss mary you know miss catherine these these are the faculties who really who understood actually because they were they were either from the christianity background or they were from the minority uh, bori and all so they understood that i am having different kind of situation that's why i'm too quiet they they really supported me they really helped me out and slowly and steadily my entire class uh, became so comfortable with me that when i moved into my third year i became the president of my students union you know and then the entire class was so comfortable they were open with me they knew Uh, they can talk to me they can do everything and all and I, as soon as i moved to my fourth year which was midwifery i took position at pakistan level so what i'm trying to tell you that if you get a good mentors and all even though you are so quiet you had such a difficult situation but you can really move yourself little bit and all and then yeah. when i did my masters in fpn bio there was many a times 
when I was the only one who used to pass in my class, all others used to get failed, right? So V26 started with EpiBio program. Though I was having so much hardship from the my my senior MBBS colleagues, they used to say, oh, our nurse have joined. Look at that woman. How would she compete us? Look, she's not doing her bedside nursing, but she would like to do her master's epi. I heard all those words by myself and I kept quiet. I said, doesn't matter. Forget about it. I need to fight. You know, this was another battle. The first battle was between different sects. The, and this battle was between two disciplines, right? So I said, no issues. I can take up my battle. I, I will keep on working. No issues. And I, I was a mother of my two small babies. And one of my baby was, I was a breastfeeding mother. So uh, my hormones were up and down. But I said, I have to struggle. I have to do the best. We were 26 enrolled and only four graduated. And in that four graduation, I was one of the one. And I took, you know, my my grades and everything was so good that everyone was so proud of me. And and then at that time, uh, the trustees members came to me with Shamska Simlakov saying that we are so proud that uh, you you have graduated. Uh, but my, it was never announced in the convocation that she's the first nurse who have done EpiBio. I really wanted them to say that I requested, mm-hmm. but I understand the policy. But somehow Shams Kasim Laka was aware, the president. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. he said that uh, Fazeen is the first nurse in Pakistan who have done this. And I got mm-hmm. a lot of trustees and board support and all. There I learned that, you know, even though I will become, I, I decided even though I'll become president of any institution or a board of any institution, I will still stay humble, which mm-hmm. I learned from my background and knowledge and all that. Being humble, being soft, being positive, being a good mentor, it's important one need to keep on growing. After my master's epi bio, my three of the class fellows got very high positions other than me. And they wanted me to go back to the same position because whatever they decided, it was always not for the nurse. It was always for the MBBS and all. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit, you know, struggling. I was speaking to my supervisor. I said, you know, you have come from America. You understand that nurses do get, but then no one was ready to hire me. No one was ready to take me. I'm really thankful to Dr. Bhutta. When he came to know, he said, Tazeen, you are more than welcome to join me. But I, my area was not the child pediatrics, you know. My area was more adolescence and, you know, postpartum, maternal, natal. So I want to do, now they, it has become woman and child. That we never had any. So I said, no, I want to stick to it. And I, I do not want to continue the same place. So, so I, I was really struggling and spoke to provost of that time. So it was another battle of my life that uh, because my background was not MBBS or my background was not nutritionist or not some other important background or based on that, they had a criteria. Finally, it, uh, the chair of the CHS department and uh, my a dean of school of nursing where Dr. Rosina Karmeliani and Yasmin Amarasi really played a big role. They had a back and forth discussion about me because I was continuously, you know, knocking their door that meant something. And finally, she said that I will hire Tazim as a senior instructor uh, for school of nursing. Then mm-hmm. I was having a little problem and I said, senior instructor uh, doesn't have many, many publications. At that time, I had 12 publications and I had two grants, one from Population Council, because while I was a student, I wrote down so many grants. I said, um, I am different. I should be hired as assistant professor. Assistant professor of that time did not require PhD and I was master's prepared and it's for highest degree at that time because no one was PhD at that time in Pakistan as a nurse and it was a highest degree and Epi bio, and especially I told you, I spent my sold my gold, sold my some of the lands. So it was very important for me. And then I had to pay back a lot of loan. It was important for me that to get a good position. But she said, no, we will take you as a senior instructor at moment. We'll see because it's not a mercy. The entire people over sitting over there were not sure if I can be a good teacher. You know, they were mm-hmm. not sure. But the Dr. Mercy and Dr. Rosina was pretty sure that. The zine is having a lot of qualities. She can do it. I'm really mm. thankful to them and I'm always thankful. So uh, finally, I enrolled as a senior instructor. But then so as soon as I became senior instructor, my writing skills, my bringing granting skills, everything was a little bit different. So I started writing down many papers. And then when I, my papers became 25, and then the, uh, I said, I need to become assistant professor. Honestly speaking, people rejected, you know, first time. She can't, uh, you know, with my so many my three to four grants with my 25 publications. 
with my such a strong teaching experience because i was teaching at urangi town to doctors nurses pharmacists everyone was coming to my field because i was having the best monitoring and evaluation system so i was teaching them the entire thing and all my teaching colleagues were there and i was a teacher when i was a young girl also i started mm-hmm. teaching when i was only 8 years old to the small kids and i was mm-hmm. helping my mother to be able to run her tuition center and school so i was having a lot of teaching experience i used to teach to the boys older than me who had to go to a credit college for maths so i was mm. having very good teaching experience and all but somehow mm. there was some discrimination or people were not trusting on me and all but then slowly and sadly when second time i applied then other than dr mercy and rosina miss ann fernandez who supported me when i was a first year student she said she is someone who can really come through give her a chance we have to give her a chance and finally i became assistant professor and then as i became assistant professor things were so simple for me every because then i became little bit more powerful kind of you know mm. when i got the power i started helping others and all mm. and then i came to know honestly my phd was also one of a story uh, you know uh, i know i'm sure people must be very uh, curious what happened you know because of being humble nice and taking care of others and all all these practices which i received from my family from my uh, teaching uh, my studies background and all i came to know some of the stakeholders some of the delegates are coming from the uh, sweden uh, doc dr bob land really brought in some funding and then for 15 of them are coming to karachi and no one is available for them to take it to them to see side and mm. uh, dr anwar siddiqui said that the zine is this possible for you i said dr anwar siddiqui i'm having some plan with my family but i will cancel it out and i will mm. go with them because for me it's important to take care of others and we have to be very humble and nice with our guests so i will definitely go and then it was very interesting when i went over there uh, they all liked my style and everything and all and they said okay what have you done in your life and i started telling them all the stories that i have worked for menstrual practices i have worked for postpartum practices and then menopause and then malnutrition and then antenatal and then they were started laughing and they said what have you identified overall i just the first word came out from my mouth was discrimination mm. and they said what kind of discrimination i said i noticed that we are in our society we are having so much of discrimination in our mm. institutions so many people even do not know this is discrimination and they said do you think this is bullying or discrimination i said i am very confused whether i should call it harassment bullying mm. violence ignorance or just discrimination or inequalities and this you know one of a professor started laughing and he said do you want to learn all these things uh, i said yes why not he said do you want to do phd with us mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. honestly my my process with chicago university was was initiated and i've gone to half way for my admission but as soon as they said that they said why don't you come once to sweden and then we'll mm-hmm. see and i spoke with my family my family was all Uh, so, Doctor Tazin, uh, before you break up, you were talking about your PhD experience, and you said that uh, you were invited to come to Sweden. Uh, would you continue from there? Yeah. So then, when I went over there, uh, I really learned that okay, what is violence against women? What is violence against children? What is violence against elderly population? What is violence against men? You know, many many things I started learning over there, and then I realized. that in our culture you know many many things are happening which people are not aware they do not know it's not that they are doing it deliberately they do not know about it you know mm. that this kind of comments this kind of behavior is not a culture it's basically an harassment or bullying mm. or violence and all and then mm. i wrote down my thesis uh, in the area of global health mm. uh, focusing on gender based violence especially violence against women and then after my phd uh, honestly my, in my phd my in my defense the the entire room was full you know everyone mm. was so interested and it was full with asian population you know mm. asians and uh, middle east country uh, other countries population they were the room was full because everyone was so interested to learn what is happening then mm. afterwards i came back to pakistan and then i facilitated my students to write down their thesis in this area but slowly mm. and steadily i realized that until unless i am having some understanding of policy gaps you know how to develop the policies and all it will not be suffice so then i did my post doctorate 
focusing in the area of policy development and in focusing on how to take care of inequalities within the society so mm. this is the, how i did it but you know sometime uh, when you are not aware of many things it's also good for you but if you are aware of many things then wherever you look at it you know so mm. it seems like that now you are wearing a lens so now i mm. feel like that i really have to do a lot for the people for to make them learn to build their capacity in this area so i started writing down different grants then mm. rather than only just my research grants developmental grant capacity building grants where i you know conducted many many trainings for doctors for nurses for midwives for media people for police force mm. for many many other mobilizers and all the only reason was and, and honestly you know they said that we have learned it in our curriculum Uh, but mm-hmm. we never realized how it is done and the big thing is that that you have given us the understanding what need to be done and all so this is my life you know kind of my education the highest education but mm-hmm. the different kind of challenges and issues uh, including you know many discriminations inequalities and all and even in my institution but i'm really glad and i really would like to give a round of applause to the university that whoever provost presidents came uh, they ensured that who is competent should mm. come come in front rather than you know people from different sex no they are only mm. focusing on the hard work and competency and someone who's resilient someone who's humble understand who it's important we need to be empathetic and sympathetic you know it's important mm. so probably these are the things that which people decide that i should come up to this highest position so i'm really grateful to those people who have supported me right so you talked about doing research in a very difficult topic that is violence right so uh, you and then you talked about because you had some experiences and then you wanted to understand those experiences you showed shared that those experiences with some experts and that led to the continuation of your career right i mean for a new new researchers epi bio graduates or there are those who are students how would you suggest them to pick an area of their research work okay right uh, the way i have picked up this could be one of the example that whatever you are observing while you are doing your clinical practice while you are looking at what is happening and all and based on that and then when when your mentors and you know when your seniors and professors try to guide you get this is one of definitely the area but my strong feelings are if you pick up the area what people are suggesting you you will mm. lose the interest right, right. people are often uh, uh, pick up their thesis area because they do not have any opportunity available so okay mm. this professor is having some kind of funding available so i will use that but you know in a long run usually you lose the interest it's important mm. that whatever you have observed from your practices whatever mm. you think that is the most important area uh, should be picked up so always pick up where you have a passion to work on you know where you really would uh, would like to help others and all another way to pick up the area is that always sit with your internet try to read what are the issues what is happening and all and then whatever things are appearing as up front try to jot down and try to see that what is your competency around it right like mm-hmm. as i said that i did not go for gender based violence or violence against women work until unless i took my theory in it when i mm-hmm. took my theory of one year then i said okay now i have full you know understanding about it and i know the area now i can learn a little bit more and i can go in depth further and i can conduct research so if you are not comfortable in one of a area i would suggest don't do that because mm-hmm. you are basically killing yourself and also wasting others time because then in the long run you will not be going to work in this area so it's important right. so always build your competency around it so it's not only that if you are becoming you are picking up your master's thesis you are taking general education and then picking the master thesis you need to take the education around that area for example if you want mm-hmm. to work in the area of anemia then mm-hmm. malnutrition courses are more important for you take those courses you know mm-hmm. if, if you want to work in the area of hepatic disorders or cirrhosis of liver then pick up those clinical courses which is important if the courses are not there take it in your electives 
you know mm. that will help you to understand or try to read and there are so many online digital courses available some of mm. them are really free and some of them are very cheap a pays little bit of the amount and try to take those courses it's important that the relevance is there you know mm-hmm. if the relevance is not there you will not be able to understand the understanding of the theory you know it's important the understanding of the contextual area is important and the chances are that you may or you might have gone through some of the experiences right for let me give you one example i and when my student we both picked up that we will conduct a study on male family planning mm. right now we are not male number one mm. right male family planning we do have understanding and then the entire community was only females Mm. So they said, "What are we doing? We need to have mm. a male person who is expert in contraception, who can mm. discuss, who can share his views and all." And then mm. we invited the Hair Gul that you should be a part of our thesis. Right. Otherwise, then he, when he came, the thesis was so different. The tool was so different. So yeah. students should pick up the right area, and the committee who is supporting should be there. Many of our students and many of our supervisors think that. if we are collecting our data from the center of excellence then we should have a supervisor from center of excellence or a co supervisor for center of excellence so that it is easier to get the data you know hmm. that is not the right thing hmm. Hmm. other than getting the data the person should also be contributing you know many of the people put their name because they think they are giving the data or they are hmm. giving the funding but if they are co supervisors it is important they should give their mental ideas do to give their theoretical ideas you know they should contribute in the knowledge otherwise intellectual contribution it will not be there so right. that students either don't put them in a thesis if they have put them then they need to think whether they need to put them for the authorship or not so right. we really have to discuss with your supervisor these kind of things right so dr tadini you talked about the uh, obviously the subject level expertise whether you are doing research in behavioral sciences or you are doing research in violence so that's one piece of the puzzle the other piece of the puzzle is the methodological expertise to convert a real problem into something which is a research problem and making it your research question and uh, making uh, a plan to do your research so how would you suggest students to bridge this gap of the lack of research expertise in their research work you know what thank you very much i completely forgot about it about research methodology thing that research methodology is another area when a lot of you know discrimination is going on okay so let mm. me be very open over here right mm. so like master students when they come mm. in right they have only 6 months maximum one year to be able to complete mm. their thesis they cannot conduct a genetic research they cannot right. conduct a dna or dna related research they cannot conduct really use a lot of pack cells and you know they need you know serum and everything and all it's not possible for them Yes, if it is a secondary data analysis, that's a different story. When master student in Pakistan have to collect, and India and many other countries have to collect the primary data, it's important, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever mm-hmm. data collected, you may use that, but you have to collect the primary data. That's the necessity, and this is what higher education commission also want from us. So then it's important. So now in these circumstances, quantitative study is really recommended most of the time, especially for the Epi Bio uh, program. right so they are saying that statistics program and all but it doesn't say that you cannot have a mixed methodology approach in it it doesn't mm. say that right because mm. all these areas gender based violence behavioral therapies uh, mental mm. health psychology you know all these kind of stuff or play therapies and all you cannot really measure the change in quantitative numbers only it will right. not come it will not appear it is important to have the understanding Uh, by conducting qualitative part in it, right so this is an, uh, one of the i still feel that with qualitative a lot of discrimination is going on because everyone is focusing on quantitative by thinking quantitative is the only research design yeah. which is best and then they don't think cross sectional studies which is basically the most important studies in taking policy decisions right mm. so they think mm. cross sectional studies having a very low uh, you know temporal relationship so then we really cannot pick up that so we need to go for cohort study designs but then and retrospective cohort we know that retrospective cohort is having a lot of challenges in the situation of pakistan and asian countries we do not have that kind of surveillance system or registry system or or you know the data 
is not being collected in a very proper manner we are having some limitations around it people are not so sensitive about monitoring evaluation and research so then retrospective cohort is is the big big issue prospective cohort is not possible third in the five months of time what are they going to do then whatever do we have is cross you know case control study designs you know simple study designs and then with one case control study design what student is going to learn so then it's important they need to understand their area they should when they are saying master so it's mean that mastery of their this area you know mm. it's not mm. the undergraduate level that they can, okay mm. they have learned once and fine they have to understand that only one study design is not important mixed methodology is important so i'm glad today after so much of back and forth fight so mine with so many different people i'm glad that now the previous and the uh, today's director have understood and now they do allow students mixed methodology so i think qualitative part is always important i can use one of example of my student varda who who wanted to understand stroke so then she was mm-hmm. looking at the stroke what is the outcome of a stroke what is happening with the caretakers and all but the qualitative part actually gave her the essence to understand what is mm. happening with them mm. you know mm. the outcome of a stroke whatever it is but there are some quality elements attached with it and her thesis was the first one mixed methodology and slowly and steadily people adopted honestly speaking i also conducted a mixed methodology when i was a student in 2000 no one took the qualitative part of mine everyone said oh just pick up this thing for your quantitative when quantitative was so weak you know it was it was necessary to be supported by qualitative but later on i published 11 papers out of it you know right. so then yeah then i was convincing others that you know whatever qualitative is should be collected and so i would suggest students if they are really running one quantitative study bio there are uh, there was a time when no one used to talk about qualitative right so this right. this is the another area i really faced a lot of discrimination that my projects whenever i wrote down the articles either was in qualitative or it was in mixed methodology and then mm. people never liked it they wanted to see the digital world the virtual world the dna the you know those kind of stuff the cds and what not so i was ne- never been so much supportive and and i had to write down 50 grants in which and, and submit 15 grants and and i used to hardly used to get one grant you know the probability mm. of getting the grant from the beginning was very low for me and this people like me you know who understand quantity quality and then who are mm. understanding the discipline who are belonging to different discipline right. so uh, for for students this is the sec- first thing is that that always have a good team relevant team second one is definitely go for a mixed methodology approach and third one uh, please do not wait that uh, whatever assignments and mini studies you are conducting do not wait till the end after your thesis you will do the publication try to mm. publish as much as possible just write down a letter to editor just mm. write down a small article newspaper article do mm. whatever keep on practicing that then they could become you know when in the in the defense when externals come to know that this student have already published this his thesis or her thesis mm. and have already yeah. published similar areas it gives a lot of confidence to the examiners Mm-hmm. that is a very important tip and i would want to speak to that point of yours in terms of the mixed methods studies recently as you might be aware that my area my interest has uh, there has been a lot of interest in my and in on narcissism and that is also connected to voiless and i was having a discussion with one of our colleague yesterday and it was like if you have to go and do a quantitative quantitative study on narcissism and there are so many traits nobody is going to accept it that because narcissist is a person who is not going to accept uh, their own vulnerability or their own lack of empathy so in these kind of areas uh, for example narcissism or for example sensitive areas as reproductive health or uh, stis or maybe if i want to do a study on say terrorist extremist tendencies or terrorism right so qualitative studies are, to my understanding are more suited as compared to quality, quantitative because and nobody is going to accept that they have those vulnerabilities but qualitative study will give you some a lens which Edge. you you can make something out of that what is your take on that point so true so true qualitative studies uh, is giving us the edge qualitative studies giving us the opportunity to become 
the you know to become a participant with with the person to whom you are conducting the interview sometime mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. also share your own experiences when qualitative co- quantitative do not allow you qualitative i i meant qualitative earlier when i said qualitative right Qual- qualitative i meant qualitative so qualitative study actually give you an edge to understand what is happening it give you the opportunity to speak to the person for longer period of time not in 20 minutes it gives you opportunity to talk in to 60 to 90 minutes even though people are hiding in 60 to 90 minutes they are mm. started becoming comfortable with mm. you and all and you can tell them that we will maintain your confidentiality and all and then qualitative is also giving you opportunity to be the participant you know you can share your own experiences what uh, experiences people are having and all so you notice that when you started my questions i started with my own experience you know this is the okay. this is the exactly a trait of a qualitative right though i am a combination of quantity and quality but still qualitative it gives you a lot of opportunity uh, to talk to people to explore people and to understand relationships to understand thinkings to understand what need to be done what you have talked about it's different forms of violence it's called societal violences you know mm-hmm. crime and terrorism these are all societal violences mm-hmm. and honestly mm-hmm. speaking as i said in my in the beginning that many of the people don't know what they are doing they don't understand so they, really cannot... they, they don't understand it intellectually that okay this is something so serious or a violence exactly right? they do it because they think that in the past our seniors have been doing it our uh, family have been doing it you know our adults have been doing it they really do not know that what are they doing so uh, and then the family member cannot tell them that it's uh, the and you cannot really sit over there and tell them oh you are doing a wrong thing the best thing is that to conduct researches uh, to right. publish the researches with by keeping the confidentiality and then based on the researches we need to conduct dissemination seminars and we right. need to invite the people and then policy need to this is will so dr tazim uh, i think with the little time which we have left i think you talk about uh, you have so many publications but you have around 23 grants and in the research world uh, i think grant bringing in grants i mean grant is a whole science of its own self that how to bring grants when to start writing for grants have to become the part of the teams that bring grants so first of all my question is that at which time researchers should start to think of bringing in grants into their institutions wonderful question see there are three things the first thing is that it is dependent on the institution also many of the institutions are saying okay likewise we are having european institutions uh many institutions are having this okay we will form the institution says we will give you a salary right now salary people could bring by conducting their their clinics like clinicians are doing right researchers need to bring in their own salary so they need to bring in their percentage whatever uh, researches they are conducting if we discuss about nih grant bill and melinda grants and all they are giving opportunity to the researcher not only to bring their salary but also to bring some amount for the institution also so mm-hmm. you know whatever money they give for the researcher to conduct the researches they research researcher could divide the money for the institution for the department for themselves and then they can bring money more than their salary only so their salary will be paid off and still they will have some amount see so this is one thing which is very important that institutions are telling us to bring your own salary the second most important thing is that when you are working as a researcher you are helping the entire world the entire mm. global world you are helping the funding agency also you know when you are mm. conducting a very good research you are helping the funding agency also because mm. it is also increasing their caliber their mm. institution so mm. you should al- always bring your salary why not because mm. you are working with any other institution but if the donor is getting a lot of information or donor is paying you um, you should also take the amount to compensate your salary so that you can give your productive time to the research mm. this second thing and third is that you know people like me will always be comfortable to bring the salary if i don't have to if for example two days i am putting it in my research and then somebody is saying though you have to teach for the five days a week and you have no option then it's not fair on me that five days a week i'm teaching and then i i stop the two of the days i'm working for my research though i have done this in my past honestly speaking 
until unless I became a stakeholder myself, you know. So it was yeah. happening that people were, you know, teaching 100% and then also doing their research work in the evenings on weekends and all. But it's not healthy. Mm. It can harm a person. It can harm both of the places, the education mm. side and the research side and all. So mm. a third is that always give quality time to mm. one area when you are doing that. And then if you have 12 hours per day where you are working, so you, you should have two to three hours during the work to relax, to you know mm. have a mental um, healthy environment and you need to regain mm. from many of the issues and all. And then mm. give time, quality time to, to each of the tasks which is assigned to you. So it's important that uh, always bring the money. It's important. But the satisfaction what researcher get is when you conduct a good research, mm. when you disseminate it, and when based on that, we have some policy development, either policy dialogue, even sometimes just have a policy dialogue and leave it. As a researcher, mm. you are not a policy developer. But mm. whatever you could contribute, and try to disseminate your research to the others. So mm. it will give you a lot of satisfaction. Here, I really want to give my one important experience mm. that when I completed my master's, where my postpartum practices were identified that having a lot of issues and all. And mm. I was the one who was involved in the development of the curriculum of National Health Worker Program. There, mm. wasn't, there wasn't any discussion about postpartum hygiene. You know, mm. there was a discussion on the immunization, lactation. Are you with me? And the discharges that would be like this, uh, you know, and then first it's going to be red color, brown color, pink color, you know, and then it will go away and the uterus uh, will go back and all blah, 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 and nutrition. But no one talked about the hygiene. Hmm. I published it in the Urdu newspapers. I published it in the English newspaper, different, different places and all. And then afterwards, that time we were having executive DHOs, DHOs and executive. DGs were on the top, but executive DHOs were the ones who were taking care of everything. Today, we mm. have replaced with DGs, right? So mm. I uh, shared with him. He was so positive. And then he said, mm. give us in writing and then we will adopt. And today, if you look at the curriculum of National Health Worker Program, they do mm. talk about the hygiene. They do talk about many, mm. many things. So I feel so comfortable, even though no one knows about it, that it's mm. me who have done it. But I don't bother. I'm happy mm. because I could contribute. Similarly, when my researches were conducted in violence against women, gender-based violence and everything and all, mm. I started speaking to different different people around. And finally, Root Gars, uh, mm. who was involved in development of the policy by involving politicians, they used all my and Dr. Rosina Karmaliani's publication. Mm. And then all the lawyers sitting in that room were admiring us. And then finally, a policy was developed in the be beginning. They placed a fatwa on it. But then slowly and sadly, they said, no, none of a husband is allowed to beat the wife. This is mm. not fair. And even in Islam, if they are saying it is allowed, it's a very special, particular situation. But not that. That's a debate. I mean, sorry to cut exactly. you. I mean, that's a debate. I mean, I think I would say that you're not allowed to beat your right but sorry i took it you off from that point exactly but yeah. then it's it's like that that like this like this that nothing happens you know is that yeah. there is no any mark on a skin right so many many things yeah. are there so then finally government and everyone understood all the religious leaders understood and they said no at the end everyone said no one should beat their wife it's not yeah. fair yeah, exactly and finally so no one knows it's my and Dr. Rosina's research. No one knows we are involved in policy. No one gave yeah. us recognition later on. We do not bother about it. We are happy mm. being a nurses, being a scholars, being a professor. We were able to contribute this much. Even I'm yeah. making so many differences in working with AKRSP, which is Aga Khan Health Services, Aga Khan RSP Rural Health uh, AKDN Program, where, where there wasn't anything about gender per se, direct gender-based violence per se, but now they are having policies. Mm -hmm. And who worked? It's me and Dr. Rosina quietly worked with everybody and they respected us. So this is what I wanted to say that until unless you disseminate it, nothing will happen. Right. So it brings <laughs> back to my original question that or in the new researchers, at which stage would you suggest for them to look into bringing grants to your institution? <laughs> So I think as soon as you enter in the master's program, students should start writing down a proposal. Mm. And then if somebody is saying that, okay, we have the funding available, you can join us. They should write down a proposal of saying, 
that please review our proposal give us the comment and give us a funding on that you know so behave a different person you know as soon as they are part of a master's program right mm. so they need to start behaving as a different person as a researcher because if mm. i am the one who's bringing grant for five people out of that three will come to me i'm having family problems you know i'm working ma'am i don't have any time to work on my proposal and this and that so why did you become a master student first of all if mm. you have become a master the student your responsibility starts from there you should mm. act like a mature person a person mm. who should write down proposals and all other than your thesis you should be involved in different kind of research is also honestly mm. people think that they will it will be wasting their time no you will become more powerful in your your capacity so it's important that you should be involved in many multiple different kind of researches students what students are basically doing as soon as they become master student they are busy talking about their faculties talking about the system blah 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 mm-hmm. blah 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 honestly it's always good to talk about but only talk about in a limited time with the right people don't mm-hmm. gossip here and there there that that's a wastage of time try to focus on your publications try to focus on writing on grants students get so many grants higher education give them a grant agrafan university give them a grant habib university there are so many universities give them uh, give the grants to the students write down mingle with other students write down grants bring in small amount of money and try to you know conduct small researches beside your studies and all your masters program should make you a kind of new person you are entering to a different world of scholarship right mm-hmm. as soon as you graduate students completely forget about to publish their thesis i'm so surprised the thesis it's not a easy task you should publish your thesis at least one or two papers should come out from your thesis and then mm-hmm. simultaneously you should keep on writing down small grants right because as soon as you become a master graduate you still have some seed grants available many universities are i know dow is having i know jina is having many many universities are having seed grant and then it's just that nurses are having uh, some problem because then their criteria they have forgotten to write about a nurse but keep on trying keep on writing down the grants the way i have done it uh, people will say oh it's a very good proposal pollination mm-hmm. council read my proposal and said wow it's a very good proposal without a single change they gave me funding mm-hmm. right so is similarly with bill and melinda uh, i got the funding without a single change in my proposal mm-hmm. uh, though many institutional Uh, funding agencies refused and i used the same proposal and i got the grant so what i'm trying to tell you that people do have some uh, edge for you they do have some soft corner for you that you are a recent graduate uh, you have you are a student and all use that soft corner of the people and try to apply and all as soon as you complete your masters 5 uh, years down the road and then you apply for a grant and then people come to know that you have not even published your thesis Mm. Yeah, with a little, little yeah. time, yeah. Left, uh, I would just ask you if you have to say anything else before. I think we just have uh, around two minutes uh, to go. Uh, uh, I, I would, I would like to say that I wish we had more time. Uh, there are so many things in which I want to go into a lot of details, but I understand you do not. Uh, I mean, there is a limit to your time as well. Uh, so, in the last uh, one and a half minute, would you? Is there anything which you would want to say to the researchers and partners? You know, the most important thing which I always feel that I should say it, and thank you for giving me the opportunity, is that it's uh, when you are conducting researches. If you are passionate about the research, do not do it only for your promotion. Please don't do that. Right? Research is having its own essence. You know. it is it is a different competency you know and and if you are not passionate if you really do not have a clean cause around it don't conduct researches right i know people are saying that oh i have to publish this many papers that many papers then i'll become professor publish less but the best you know even one paper can make you a good professor pick up good universities all over the world so it's not the number that comes and if you have conducted one research do not leave it all alone you know make sure that you complete your all the important steps publish it disseminate it uh, disseminate it in different forums until unless is your research if you think it's very important become a part of the 
some policies or some in, and policies should not be always a national policy it can be institutional policy it can be clinical practice policy it can be province level policy it can be a policy for some academic uh, academia or curriculum and all like when i have picked up gender based violence violence against women today mbbs is learning about it it is a part of a curriculum it is a part mm -hmm. of nursing curriculum it is a part of a policy at national level part of new institutions now people are having their harassment uh, policies safe disclosure policies and all so try if you pick up anything pick up as a cause you know right. do something in a very very positive manner and be a good scholar be a good intellectual person be humble be soft be nice do not to hike any take anybody's work if you are taking anybody's work give a reference properly and it's always good to work with each other in a good manner have a good relations with each other be humble join the international world